test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Kirsten Vega and I'm the Program Associate at California Humanities and I want to thank you so much for joining us today for the Humanities for All Quick Grant Webinar for applicants interested in the upcoming June 15 deadline. We'll be online today from about 11 to 12 p.m. And if you have any technical difficulties with the GoToWebinar platform, please contact Renee Perry, our operations coordinator at rperry at calham.org. You can also send us a message in the chat. So if you haven't used GoToWebinar before, just a couple housekeeping tips. Uh, you can open and close your panel with the orange arrow. We usually recommend the phone call option under audio to get the best hearing quality. I am about to put into the chat a link to the guidelines for this round, the guidelines and frequently asked question document, which we recommend everyone review carefully uh, before they submit their application. I also want to mention that we are recording this session and we'll send a video around by email to everyone who's registered, even if they can't be here today, even if you have to leave early, you'll get the video and we'll post it to our website as well. So we'll be taking several question breaks today in between certain, uh, certain chapters of the session. If you have a question for us, please you know, submit it into the question box, which I have put in red here. We are planning to take questions mainly at the Q&A breaks. So if your question isn't getting answered right away, just hold tight. It might be that we're going to cover that shortly or later in the webinar or at another break. Um, and anyone who has lingering questions after the webinar can get in touch with Lucena Lovaye, the program officer for this line. So on the line with me today is Lucena, who I just mentioned, your main contact for this grant line, our colleague Brett Connor, grants manager, and Felicia Kelly, the project and evaluation director, who also manages the project grant uh, line of this grant program. And we have uh, a simple agenda, really. We'll start with an overview of the Humanities for All program. Uh, we know what Quick Grants is, what it intends to do. We will walk you through the application process from a technical standpoint. We'll give you some information about how the review and award process works. And then we'll wrap up with another question break and some information about how you can stay in touch with us. So now I'm going to hand it off to Lucena. Thanks so much, Kirsten, and thank you all for joining us today. I know that uh, y'all are very busy, and uh, this is a webinar that I hope you will find uh, informative and helpful, and hopefully give you some greater insights into how your project may fit into the, the goals of this program. I just wanted to take a few moments to kind of give a little bit of a background about this, this grant program. And firstly, we just wanted to um, mention the, the, the mission of our organization, and that is California Humanities seeks to connect Californians to the ideas and to one another in order to understand our shared heritage and diverse cultures, inspire civic participation, and shape our future. Um, California Humanities is an independent nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And just to mention a little bit about the um, origins and the, the history of this grant program. The Humanities for All grant program was launched in fall of 2017. And this program uh, was developed to create grant opportunities that, uh, again, would support enriching humanities, public humanities projects for organizations of all sizes and communities uh, of all sizes across our state. And we are very eager to hear more about your projects and, and the work you're about to undertake. But again, we just wanted to also spend some time talking about one of the really important aspects of all of our grant programs and the Humanities for All grants in particular, and that is the public programming. Uh, and again, the, the public humanities projects that, that these grants support. Um, so if we could move forward, let me tell you a little bit about two parts of the Humanities for All grant umbrella and on the left side 
is the Quick Grant program, which you'll be hearing a little bit more about today. And Quick Grants are um, shorter grants. These are one-year grant periods. These support smaller scale, smaller scale projects. Quick Grants provide between one to $5,000 in grant funding. And I just want to underscore that no matching funds are required. We offer Quick Grants three times per year. So the grants are offered in October, February, and June. And so just to uh, clarify, the next deadline is June 14th, 2021. So this means that the grant period for the June 14th deadline will be, be, will be between September 1st, 2021 and August 31st, 2022. On the other side of the screen, on the right-hand side, you will see the project grants. And my colleague, Felicia Kelly, manages this grant program. These are longer-term grants. They, are, uh, they offer a two-year grant period. These are for larger scale public humanities projects, and they require the involvement of a humanities expert as an advisor. Project grants offer between $10,000 to $20,000, um, and it's important to note here that a cash or in-kind match is required. There are two rounds offered per year, February and the August deadline, which is just around the corner. So let's talk a little bit more about the humanities. So um, for the purposes of our organization and the work that we are aiming to support, we have a few ways that we are very broadly defining the humanities. And first of all, we believe that the humanities enable us to understand, explore, and communicate about the human experience. We believe that humanities offer ways of knowing that focus on exploring meaning and values and promoting understanding. And we also believe that the humanities can include everyday activities and, and practices, which include reading, conversation, storytelling, reflection, and analysis. So what are the humanities? Um, you may have heard this term when you were in school or maybe in other, other places, but for, for our purposes, the humanities can encompass formal study, which includes subject areas or disciplines such as literature, history, philosophy, cultural studies, law, ethics, religious studies, as well as humanistic social sciences. Um, but humanities approaches can be applied to any subject or field. So what are the public humanities? And this is, uh, again, a crucial, crucial component of uh, the Quick Grant and Project Grant program. And the public humanities are humanity-centered learning experiences that take place outside of formal educational environments. So to kind of dig a little deeper, these are learning experiences for members of the general public, uh, folks of all ages. So there can be youth serving public humanities projects that work with young people. There can be um, human public humanities projects that are geared towards uh, elders, that are geared towards very specific populations. But the key, the key element here is that these are projects that don't require uh, enrollment in any sort of educational environment that um, you know, anyone can take part in these and hopefully that there are very few barriers for entry. And so we have some examples on our screen from previously funded projects. And uh, now we have some further specific examples, but I'll just mention in those images, these were, these were projects that happened again, you know, outside in the world, not, not in uh, the confines of, of a university, for example, or college. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So here are some specific examples. And one thing I'll note, because we are living in very unusual times, and, um, and that is that projects may be implemented using virtual platforms, in-person programming where you know deemed safe and appropriate or hybrids of the two so i just wanted to really drive that point home that um you know we understand that that as project directors you are you know trying to be nimble in the way that you present your programs so uh some examples we have forums or community dialogues film and discussion series oral history or story-based projects that produce public facing events community-wide reads with interactive programming, neighborhood history projects, 
cultural festivals, interpretive exhibits, hybrid arts with humanities projects, and again, multifaceted projects that combine elements of, of you know, the examples we have listed above. And of course, many, many more. This is just a, 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 a small snapshot. So what is not eligible for Humanities for All grant funding? Um, we cannot support funding for individual artists, scholars, or researchers creating works of art or research that will not be included in public programming. So again, I just wanted to drive that point home, that public programming is really you know, central to, to the purpose of this grant program. Um, we cannot support organizational development or general, general operating support. We cannot support open-ended or ongoing programs occurring before or after the grant period, capital improvements, planning unless tied to specific programming outputs during the grant period, research, study, creative work that is not connected to a public program, um, and again, and finally, uh, regranting scholarships, prizes, internships, artist and residency programs, or gifts. And uh, finally, on this page, um, what, again, what is not eligible for quick grant funding? Activities and projects primarily intended to advance a specific policy or political agenda or to influence legislation, which is how uh, we and our funders at the NEH define advocacy. Academic or scholarly research activities, projects that are solely accessible to an in-school audience, activities and projects primarily designed for the purposes of fundraising, marketing, including institutional or organizational promotion and advancement, uh, professional development programs or other activities geared for specialized audiences. So let's talk a little bit about who can apply. Applicant eligibility is lit limited to nonprofit organizations and or local or state government entities. So this includes public universities, colleges, K through 12 schools, libraries, museums, city agencies, and tribal governments that meet the following criteria, that they are based in California, federally tax exempt, that they have submitted no more than one application per deadline. Um, if you or your organization is a California CARES Relief and Recovery grant recipient from last year, that's fine, you can apply that you do not have an active or pending application for any other California Humanities Grant programs, the exceptions being for colleges and universities and California Humanities pre-approved multi-application multi fiscal sponsors. And again, this is something that we, you know, if you have specific questions about your organization, we ask you to reach out to us outside of this webinar and we can we can talk more. And of course, if you are a previous grantee that you are in good standing. So as we continue on, uh, returning quick grant recipients, so this includes organizations and project directors, are required to wait one year following the submission of their final reports before reapplying. Applicate, applicants cannot have an active California Humanities grant or application pending review for any other grant program. So for example, if you've submitted to both a project and a quick grant and you have two applications under review, um, you will actually be asked to uh, choose one. So you cannot have both under review. However, California Humanities will accept multiple applications, again, by universities, colleges, libraries, and arts councils, and other organizations that are pre-approved multi-application fiscal sponsors. Projects may be fiscal sponsored by eligible organizations. Um, we require a DUNS number, which is a data universal numbering system number um, for all entities receiving California Humanities funds and you can obtain a DUNS number free of charge at the address below. So let's talk a little bit about the funding guidelines. Applicants may request between one to $5,000. Matching funds, again, this is cash or in-kind contributions from non-federal sources are not required, but we also don't discourage that. Uh, grant funds should be used for eligible project-related expenses incurred during the grant period only. So again, this is something we'll talk about further down in the webinar, but again, 
that is a crucial component. Uh, and activities and public programming must take place during the grant period again, September 1st, 2021 through August 31st, 2022. And we can talk more about applying for a quick grant. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Brett Connor, and I'm the grants manager here at California Humanities. You, the, if you would advance the slide one time, the link to our grant portal is right on our homepage at the top, and actually wherever you're navigating with uh, uh, throughout our web page, that banner will be at the top. The grant portal link is right there. When you hit that grant portal link, it takes you to the username and password page. Um, many of you I know uh, have applied with us before, whether it's a quick grant or another one of our grant programs here. But in note that if you do not already have a username and password, the uh, there will be a registration link uh, on the top right hand uh, corner of that page. Next, let's talk about the application components. There's really four parts. First of all is traditionally what you'd think of as an application form, a fill in the blank, a paragraph here, emails, phone numbers, et cetera, um, with a little 100 uh, word summary of your project. The second part is a proposal narrative, uh, which the guidelines document uh, as well as on the will give you what those prompts are, what are the questions, what are the topics you should be addressing in your proposal narrative. So you can just compose that in your Microsoft Word or whatever word processor uh, that you use on your computer, and you will be uploading this document as either a Word doc or a PDF. Uh, so that's something that you will start kind of on your own, and then you will upload uh, that two-page document to our grant portal. The third component is a budget. Uh, we provide you with a specific template that you must use uh, to, to request what the dollar amount is, $1,000 to $5,000 uh, of, of your project and how you will outline uh, how you will spend or how you're proposing to spend uh, that grant amount. And then if you are fiscally sponsored, you will have uh, a task that lights up for an MOU, what we call a memo of understanding. This can also be a, a, just a, a plain and simple fiscal sponsorship agreement, something documented in writing between you, the project director, and your fiscal sponsor with some signatures on it that makes your, the relationship clear to us uh, between you and your fiscal sponsor. A couple of tips for completing your application. You can complete this application on both a PC, a laptop, a Mac. Um, for the internet browser, Chrome does work fast. Um, Safari will usually works fine, but Safari sometimes has some quirks with it, but Google Chrome works best for the browser. Internet Explorer is not supported. Uh, internet Explorer as a whole is kind of on the way out. Uh, make sure that you maximize your window when you're completing that application form, just so you don't miss where any of the buttons, uh, the buttons are sometimes at the bottom of the page. And if you don't have your page maximized, you might not be able to see that button all the way down at the bottom. Thirdly, make sure you plan for obtaining signatures. Uh, if you are, if your role is the project director for this, uh, for this application, for this proposed project, you need someone at your, uh, your organization to be who we call the authorizing re requester, uh, the authorizing official, someone at that organization that will be able to sign off. That all this, the materials uh, that you have submitted, all the data that you've given us uh, in the application form uh, is accurate and true. We'll talk a little bit about how you might uh, invite others to participate in completing the application with you, including getting that official signature. Um, bookmarking the grant portal login is always a good idea, just so you always know where it is. Again, you can find that on our homepage. When you are completing that application, there is a preview button so that you can kind of check on the status of how you're doing. 
or, or even when you're done with the application, you can download a copy for yourself. After you do submit the application and all of its required parts, you will get a confirmation email. Uh, just look out, uh, you know, sometimes if you don't see it right away, they will sometimes go to your junk or spam folder. So just be aware of that and keep an eye on that. So these are some key phrases and terms that uh, are just kind of uh, in, in our California humanities um, lectionary, if you will. So uh, the preview button, it shows you what your application is looking like at the time. We ask for two different roles uh, on an application. One is a project director, one is the authorizing official, as I mentioned before. The project director is pretty much our key contact, our primary contact, the person really responsible for carrying this project out and completing all of its uh, deliverables, such as the final report. The authorizing official, again, like I said before, is kind of the, the, the lead person, maybe a grants officer, a development person, uh, your CEO, your ED, someone at your organization who might be signing off on your application. So that's a good, uh, a good spot for us to get into uh, the, let me back up one step. The, the platform that we use to collect all of this application information is called SurveyMonkey Apply. Most people have heard of SurveyMonkey. SurveyMonkey Apply is a sister uh, piece of online software that we use for our applications. The owner of the application is the person who is initiating this process, sitting down, filling out most of the application, uh, submitting most of its parts. Uh, like I noted before, if you need somebody, if you are not the authorizing official, if you're not the person who needs to sign off on this at the very end, you will need to ask, you will need to submit a collaborator uh, inside your application. There will be a button that says add a collaborator. You'll add that person's email address and they will send, uh, the system will send them an invitation so that they can assist you in completing one of the parts of the application, maybe you don't exactly know what their best phone number is or, or what a best description of the organization is, or you need that signature at the end. The fourth bullet here says three dots. What does that mean? So while you're filling out the application or while you're completing the steps, the uploads, uh, the three dots in the Survey Monkey Apply system is something you'll often find in the upper right hand corner. And basically that's kind of like an option menu or so, so whenever you see those three dots, it just means there's something else more here. So if there's another option, if there's a, a if you're looking for an edit button, a preview button, uh, a reset button, uh, that's that's where you'll find those. When you go into the application, you'll have these tasks to complete. Like the previous slide said, there is the application form, there is the budget, there is the MOU. Um, each of these things need to be marked as complete. After all the required tasks are complete, a green submit button uh, will light up. So that, this, that final green submit button is the final key. It's not enough just to complete each task, but then once you complete all the tasks, the system will say, would you like to review and submit? Uh, make sure you hit that final uh, green resubmit button or else you probably will be uh, getting a call from me the next day uh, asking if you're done. And for the narrative, uh, is this, uh, do I go, we're going back to Lucena now, I believe. Hi there. Yes, <laughs> let me step in and tell you a little bit about the written components. So Brett mentioned the different kind of broader application components. Let me tell you a little bit about what you'll be telling us in relationship to the goals and scope of your project. So the first piece is that project, I'm sorry, the proposal narrative, and that is a maximum of two pages. Um, and I'll just say this really quickly, any proposal that exceeds those two pages will not be eligible for full review. So please do, you know, do, do pay attention to that page length. This is the part where you will tell us in section one, um, you know, describe your project and any of the related activities. We have a few guiding prompts that we recommend you, 
you know, you use this to inform your description of your project. So everything from the impact of the humanities learning experiences that your program will provide for members of the public. You give us as much detail about when and where your project activities will take place. So again, we want as much concrete detail as possible, dates, times, locations, venues, et cetera. If you have a few venues or times that are under consideration, let us know. We would prefer seeing some concrete or some information rather than you know something that's kind of vague or nebulous. And again, and I saw this question come up, the activities must take place within the grant period. So no sooner than September 1st, 2021. And if we could move to the next slide. Section two, we're asking for your objectives and desired outcomes. So again, this is all part of that two page proposal narrative. This is where you will tell us why this project is important. Why do you want to do it? What's the timeliness of this project now or you know, within that, that part of the grant period that you are hoping to launch your project? We would like to know about the anticipated impacts and benefits of this project. And most importantly, how you will assess the outcomes of your activities. What is your evaluation plan? Section three. And this is outreach and engagement. Again, this is all part of that two page narrative. We will ask you to tell us about who will participate in the project. So we would like to know target audiences and participants. And we would also like you to tell us about any new or underserved audiences that your project will reach. We would ask you, uh, we will ask you to estimate the size of your audience or the number of participants. Uh, we would like to know about how you plan to inform and engage your audiences through marketing and publicity. And uh, lastly, we would like to know more about how you'll be reducing any barriers to entry and participation by the public. So maybe this includes waiving fees, um, the scheduling of your project, the languages that your project will be presented in, et cetera. And the last section, in this proposal narrative is capacity. This is where you will tell us about the project director, and I saw some questions come up about this as well, and other key people who will plan and implement the pro proposed activity. So the people who are responsible for that overall management of the project and all of the related activities that are tied to what you are proposing to us. And we also ask that you tell us about any resources that the sponsoring organization or any other community or organizational partners will contribute to your project to ensure its successful implementation. So just some additional details about that proposal narrative. We ask that you prepare your narrative following the instructions uh, presented in the guidelines. So again, uh, as I mentioned, anything that exceeds two pages will not be reviewed. So, you know, again, please, please keep it to that link. We recommend that you use one inch margins and 11 point typeface at the smallest. <laughs> um, you know, uh, 12 point typeface is fine, but 11, I think 11 point typeface is recommended. Um, we also ask that you organize your narrative using the prompts in the order specified. So to save precious space, um, it's not recommended to repeat the prompting questions. It's fine to include, you know, section one, two, three, and four. So we know which paragraph is responding to the prompts that we've just reviewed uh, a few moments ago. And now we have time for a question break. Okay. Uh, well, looks like lots of questions here, but I'm sure many of them have been answered. So uh, just, just a couple of things where, you know, there seems to be a lot of questions about um, so, uh, people seem to need clarification, again, about the relationship between the project director and the authorizing official. You know, what's the difference there? Uh, and kind of related to that, a lot of questions about uh, who can apply. Can individuals apply? Does it have to be an organization? Um, and what's the difference between a fiscal sponsor and uh, an applicant? These are such good questions. <laughs> okay, so these, these are wonderful questions. Um, I'm gonna try to walk through what you've mentioned, Felicia. So uh, the, the project director 
and the authorizing official. Okay, so um, in some cases, the authorizing official is is not the person who is actually managing the project itself. This is a person who represents the organization, um, whether they are, you know, something like the executive director, someone who can make decisions about funds that will be going into that organization through a grant, for example. Um, so let me see if I can, if I have everything down. So the project director is the person who, you know, many cases is the person applying. This is the person who um, will be that central linchpin holding together all of the moving parts. So they may or may not be the person who is um, conducting the research, but they are the person who, for example, the researchers, the guest speakers, um, and so forth will be reporting to them. So uh, I hope that makes sense to folks. And, and I wonder if my colleagues, Brett, do you have any other <laughs> details you might add about an authorizing official? They can make decisions about funding. They, they, they can sign off on grant funds that are coming into the organization. Is there anything else that I'm missing about an authorizing official? Nope, I wouldn't think so. Okay. <laughs> so, so for example, I see, because I see a few questions uh, from folks who are from universities. Um, this may be someone from like the grants office, for example, who needs to be conferred with if you are, you know, receiving these, these external sources of funding from like a quick grant, as it were. So again, project director manages the, the content, manages all of the different people who are collaborating on a project and authorizing official doesn't necessarily have a hand in the content and the, the scope of the project. But again, they can sign off if you get if you get this grant. So question about who can apply. So as we mentioned, if we you know mentally kind of scroll back, um, applicants must either be um, from organizations that have nonprofit status, or they can include individuals or organizations that do not have nonprofit status, but are working with a fiscal sponsor. So a fiscal sponsor is an organization that will um, work with that applicant and they may, you know, oversee the project in some capacity or, you know, be involved in some capacity, but they are in a sense um, sponsoring or, you know, they are lending their, their nonprofit status to that applicant so that the applicant can um, be eligible for our grant programs. So who can apply? Um, as we mentioned, as we, you know, talked a little bit about it, uh, universities, uh, libraries, you know, nonprofit organizations, combinations of the two, uh, folks who don't have nonprofit status working with uh, a fiscal sponsor or working with an organization that does have nonprofit status that is also serving as a collaborator on this uh, grant project. We cannot, uh, we cannot support uh, individuals such as individual artists or independent researchers are not eligible. Again, this is, this is really about thinking about the applicant as organizations um, and the, you know, the, gosh, and I'm running out of words, but I wonder if, if I, if my colleagues can, can also step in. Yeah, Lucena, it's just, it's just because we have to grant out to eligible 501c3 or municipal yeah. organizations. We cannot grant out to a, someone who's just as an individual. We have to have an organization to grant to. So sometimes, so sometimes the case is you're an independent humanities practitioner um, so therefore, we can't grant out to you, but you use you can uh, locate a fiscal sponsor that handles the money side of the business. You know, so uh, a fiscal sponsor will take will uh, in most cases take the grant money from us. They might take a five ten percent cut, but then you get the rest of the money. That's that depends on the the fiscal sponsorship agreement that you might have with them. But that's what a typical fiscal fiscal sponsor. Uh, relationship uh, may look like. Thank you, Brett. That was <laughs> that was perfect. And and that's and I think one thing I'll I'll mention is that the funds that we are providing are federal funds. So these are the requirements that we have and that you know the NEH has in place to grant out these funds. Okay. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. Um, thank you, Brett. Thank you, Felicia. Any other questions before we move on? Um, 
It looks, it looks like there are a lot of very specific questions about different types of programming formats. Okay. So I'm sure you probably want to follow up with folks like individually yeah. about those. But just generally, um, seemed like there was, you know, quite a few questions about what we mean by public programming, public humanities programming, and distinguishing public from uh, programs for professionals mm -hmm. or for students in school. Yeah. So maybe something around that. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, I, I saw that as well. So um, as we mentioned way back in the beginning of the webinar, uh, when we say public humanities, you know, we are really, again, thinking about the broadest, the broadest swath of the general public. So something like, you know, um, like a discussion series for arts educators, like something very hyper specific to a field or to, to folks who are working within, um, you know, some some sort of subset of, you know, a, a professional organization that is not eligible. Again, we are looking for learning interactive and publicly engaged learning experiences that you know your next door neighbor could access and, and may have interest to to you know um you know folks across our state or folks within your particular community and as we mentioned earlier you know we're really trying to reduce as many barriers for participation so this is something that we we think you know well what is public you know again nowadays it can include a virtual format. It can include a hybrid of in-person and virtual programming. But you know, if it's a project that is very specific to, um, let's say, like students taking part in a class, again, that's what we might consider like an in-school audience. And there's no public-facing component, so that that folks who are not part of that class cannot access it. That's also ineligible. So. You know, again, I think every project has probably a similar question that, that's very unique to what they're trying to do. And so if you'd like to follow up with me, we can have a conversation and we can kind of talk through the details of your project, who your audiences are. And again, you know, that, that, that publicly accessible piece, which is for us a central criteria. Okay, <laughs> shall we jump back into the okay. webinar? And I I think it's, I'm passing the baton to Kirsten. Hey, thanks, Lucena. Let's talk about the project budget. So kind of guidelines for some eligible expenses here. Basically anything that you need to fund and support your public programs will be eligible in your budget. So we'd like to see any ways that you're compensating your administrative and program staff. So those salaries and benefits can certainly be covered. Similarly, any speakers or guest presenters you bring into your programs, their honoraria and stipends are eligible here. Any kind of supply or material, you know, paper, uh, you know, office supplies, things that actually help you deliver the program, eligible. Marketing and outreach, uh, evaluation, kind of support expenses for those areas are eligible. We also can cover and offer uh, funding for food and refreshments for your programs with the exclusion of alcoholic beverages. Again, because of our funding source being the federal government, we're not allowed to support alcohol. Um, that does not mean that you can't serve alcohol at your events, only that you would need to find a different source of funding for that. As Brett mentioned, fiscal sponsors will often charge a fee of five or 10% or so. We ask that you cap a uh, request for reimbursement of these fees at 10% of your total award. We have a full accounting of these eligible expenses in the FAQ document, which I popped into the chat. So take a look there. Now let's look at the budget template, which we provide for you. So this is an Excel document, which as Brett mentioned, you do have to use our budget with your application. And it is really asking for a whole picture of your budget, your entire project budget, not only the funds that you're planning to request from California Humanities. So be sure to allocate all of your expenses across these rows and columns. The first column, is for the amount of money that you've spent prior to the grant period. And this might not be relevant to all of you or to all applicants. The second column is for the California Humanities grant funds request. And then the next column here is for matching funds, which is not required of quick grant applicants, but might be relevant for some of you. 
The following column is for matching in-kind services or materials, um, also not required. And then the next column uh, asks for any additional federal funds. So if your project is supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities or another federal agency, please put in those numbers there. Um, this template is required in your application, but it is malleable, you know, it is flexible, so you can add more lines as needed to present your information as clearly and as completely as possible. The uh, Excel template has some kind of calculating uh, mechanisms in it, but please do check your math. And then we'll move into an example of this template in just a moment, but first I want to point out that at the bottom of the template is a space for your budget narrative. So you can follow the instructions we provide here. Some of the really great ways to use this budget narrative section is to show your math. So, you know, if you've hired someone to help you with evaluation at an hourly rate, you can show how you're calculating their hourly rate. Uh, here's the place to identify people who will be working on your project, whom you'll be paying honoraria, staff, salary, benefits, and to allocate their stipends. Um, here is where you can show us how your budget really aligns with what you've written in your proposal narrative. We ask that you take time to break down your line items um, and show us how you came up with any amounts that you're using. So this is the budget narrative, and here is an example of an excellent uh, project budget form, which was approved, um, I think, back in 2016. So you can see they've used all of the rows and columns, but they've also customized the rows to indicate the names of their artists that they're paying. They have added in some translation services under program. They have... Be, they've been very granular, right? We see postage for the newsletter. And then here's their narrative section with the staff salary calculations, the program expenses break down, broken down really nicely. Um, so this would be a great example and you're welcome to return to it. Um, I believe we have it for download in our website with sample examples of applications, but it's also available in the slide deck, which we'll send around after the webinar. And now it's over to you, Brett. Thank you. So this slide uh, is showing you a what you typically might look like while you are completing uh, your application online. So you can see that on the left hand pane of this screenshot where those check boxes are, those are the different required tasks uh, that the application will be asking uh, for you. So you can see there's three check boxes. There's one on required reading, one on an eligibility quiz, one on the application form. You can see that the, the narrative statement, the upload budget, the memo, memorandum of understanding are do not have check boxes. So that's kind of indicating the first three are done, the last three are not. So those are the tasks um, that you have le left to complete. You can kind of see underneath that yellow uh, square, it says three of seven tasks complete. So after all the required tasks are complete, the green submit button uh, will appear. But the main pr premise of this slide is you choose one of these tasks in the left pane and on the right pane, that task will appear for you to fill in a form or upload a document or what have you. And here's a great example of showing that all of your tasks are now complete. And so that review and submit green button has lit up for you. When you hit that button, we receive the information and you receive a confirmation. And here's, here we have another, uh, another uh, opportunity to, um, to take some questions. Uh, one question that I'm seeing a lot, I've tried to answer a couple times, but I do want to talk about this, is people are asking about, can uh, if I'm using a fiscal sponsor and I want them to sponsor my, my project, I want to apply with them, but they also want to apply their own project. So this is what, this is that case, uh, in, in most cases, this is not going to be allowed unless you are a university or a college. Um, but we do have a special circumstance. We do have a special criteria that you can meet to become a multi-application fiscal sponsor. 
and the requirements for this designation is listed in the uh, in the documents off the top of my head. I, can you help me, girls, if it's in the if it's in the guidelines or the FAQs? Um, we include it, I think, in the FAQs, and we yeah. mention it in the guidelines, but we break it down a little further in the FAQ. So if you're concerned that your fiscal sponsor might need to apply and to try to sponsor more than one uh, project, take a look at those requirements and, and, and make sure you move, if it's that's something you do really need to look into, move on that quickly. Uh, contact me uh, with those requirements and uh, uh, because that will need to go to our CEO for approval. Uh, in most cases, folks, you know, this is not this is not the situation for everybody. So I will just put that out there. Thanks, yeah, Brett. There were, there were a couple of questions about uh, uh, paying consultants or uh, humanities advisors or other folks who are working on projects. Maybe you could clarify that just a little bit more. Yeah, and I, I saw some questions folks had about, um, I think people were asking if they could use the grant funds to pay for like a speaker stipend or a researcher. And, and that's, yes, that's, that's definitely eligible um, if the person is contributing, you know, to some aspect of the project. Um, I hope I, that, that clarifies it. You know, you would, you would be required to include a line item in your budget, as Kirsten had mentioned. And in the, in the budget narrative section, which is that, you know, that big kind of block at the very bottom of the budget, we also ask that you provide rates of pay. Um, tell us a little bit also in the proposal itself, you know, what this person is going to be doing, especially if they're receiving grant funds, so that the proposal narrative and the budget can sync up. Um, someone had mentioned, I think, about having a, a collaborator who is out of state, and that's fine. You know, we recognize that there may be people with, with very specific subject areas that are not um, in California. But, you know, just to clarify, the, the audiences do need to be primarily, you know, California-based audiences. And um, again, you know, you would be including the expenses or the, the individual collaborators in your budget, you know, giving us all those details in that, that budget narrative. And, um, you know, again, we understand that, that as the project director, you are that person who, you know, who is kind of bringing all of these different people together to contribute to this, the bigger goals of this project. Um, let me see, are there any other projects? Or any other questions, sorry, that folks are asking? Yeah, there were a couple of questions about the match. Um, okay. You know, what's, what, again, what, you know, what, what is counted as in-kind match? And uh, how do folks uh, factor in uh, income, you know, if they're getting a revenue stream from their, from their project activities? Okay, so, okay, so in-kind, yeah. So say, for example, um, you are receiving other sources of grant funding or the organization that you work with is also you know contributing other sources of funding um then that would be you know the other in kind in kind funding that that's going to help pay for a project we recognize that some projects are going to use just the five thousand dollars of quick grant funding and other projects are much 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 larger and they will have other sources of funding. Um, and I don't have the budget in front of me, but I believe we have a column that is for um, match as well as, you know, other sources of funding that that will be, you know, uh, supporting the project. Um, I think the important thing is just, you know, that you, again, clarify what the quick grant funding will do and, and how specifically that quick grant funding will be supporting the public humanities portion of the project. I know I saw a question someone asked, if there are expenses that are not eligible for quick grants, but it's gonna be paid from another source, um, that's fine. We understand that it will not affect the competitiveness of your project. We just want to know, again, that the quick grant is coming in to this bigger project budget. And it is, again, supporting the research delivery evaluation of 
public humanities programming, you know, something that is in socially engaged, that's available to the public. And, you know, we get that that may um, be something from like a Zoom license, because, right, you might be doing like a, a virtual program, or maybe that will be a guest speaker, or maybe that will be, as Kirsten mentioned, an evaluation team that's going to help you. Um, but again, it's it's really what that quick grant will do in supporting the public humanities part of your project. Okay, hope that <laughs> hope that answers the question. Um, any any other? I guess we can do one short one real quick because I realize we have ten minutes to go. Yeah, there's a whole slew of very okay. specific questions about expenses, so maybe yeah. better to pick those up individually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I see that now. Yeah. Yeah. We can, we can talk more about that offline. Um, but let's, let's actually pivot and talk about review notification and award process. Thank you so much, Brett and Felicia for your help. Sure. Sure. Okay. So let's talk about the review process for quick grants. So the review includes a few different things, a few different moving parts that begins with due diligence. Um, this is also uh, the part of the process where applications are reviewed for their competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the criteria that we've just mentioned, as well as consideration of other special factors. That takes about two and a half months. So if you're wondering, you know, when will I hear about the status of my grant application, at the very top of your guidelines, um, we have this kind of very short, very brief calendar spelled out. But the, this will, this notification will happen between mid to late August of 2021. So you can mark that in your calendar. So the review criteria begins with quality. So, you know, we're looking at the clarity of the project purpose you've described. We're looking at the objectives and proposed outcomes. We are looking for an awareness of and responsiveness to the interests, needs, and characteristics of your target audience. So again, we're looking at audience focused programming, including any the resolution of any potential barriers to access. So we're also looking for a, a high level of community support and interest in the project, as well as evidence that the project team has the necessary level of experience and skill to successfully implement the proposed project. We're looking really, you know, this is a, I think if I could get a highlighter, I'm going to highlight this, the feasibility and soundness of the project activities, budget, outreach, and evaluation plans, and uh, the suitability of the sponsoring organization and partners or collaborators to implement the project, again, as shown by prior experience, contribution of resources, and or level of interest shown in the project. So what makes a proposal stand out? Uh, firstly, uh, thoroughness and completeness of your application and your narrative and your budget. There's no missing information or elements. All information is consistent. The project, again, is audience-centered. It demonstrates awareness of and efforts to respond to target audiences, especially those that are new and underserved. That, most importantly, the humanities are a central piece of your project. They're not tangential to but again, central. The project is ambitious, but also realistic, um, that the budget is reasonable and the request from California Humanities is justified. And lastly, the project team has the needed capacity. All personnel receiving, as we just said earlier, California Humanities funds are identified in the proposal and again, noted in the budget narrative. The award process. Applicants will be notified via email in late August 2021. The number of projects funded each quick grant cycle varies depending on the funds that are available for each grant cycle. Reviewer comments are provided to all applicants upon request, but please note it takes about 60 days to receive panel comments. Revision where feasible and desired and uh, uh, the application for future rounds is encouraged if the initial request is not funded. And so we have our last culminating question break. Um, anything that we haven't caught? <laughs> uh, well, there are a lot of questions, but uh, again, I think some of them are very specific. So, um, Let's see what, uh, you know, maybe some, uh, 
some general uh, questions again about the size of the project budget. Is there a limit on the size of the project budget? Oh, uh, great. A minimum, yeah. you know, anything of that nature. Okay, great question. Yeah, there's no, there's no maximum or minimum project budget. Um, you know, we've had projects from organizations of all size that that vary significantly. I think um, so. You know, we offer between one to five thousand dollar in quick grant funds. And just as an example, you know, some project directors have used, you know, some portion of one to five thousand dollars for the entire project budget. But that was also a very small project. You know, that was that that project was, uh, you know, it it matched the amount of funds that they were using. Um, and, and conversely, you know, we've we've supported, we've provided funding for projects that were, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and we just our funding came in and, and supported one portion of it. That's fine. There's no, um, you know, you're not going to receive uh, greater consideration based on the size of your budget. If anything, we we're really looking for, as we mentioned, a project that is ambitious. You know, you're trying to do really impactful, wonderful things but that you're also realistic about how quick grant funds are going to contribute to the delivery of whatever your project might be. Um, so as you know, as we mentioned, it, it's there's really no set budget, ideal budget that we're looking for. It's just that the numbers add up, that the individuals who are, you know, again, experts, guest speakers, you know, whomever are being provided funds for their contribution and that all the other aspects of the project are sufficiently funded as well. Um, you know, and I think that that really varies from project to project. But again, you know, we're, we're really keen on projects that are available to the members of the general public um, that are, you know, few barriers to entry as possible. And, you know, this is important because the budget is able to ensure that all of those needs are met. So, so yeah, so no, you know, no idealized project budget. Um, but again, you know, between one to $5,000 of quick grant funds are explicitly described in your proposal and narrative and how you're going to use it. And the line items, you know, again, in your budget match up and, and provide a lot of detail about what all of those different expenses will, will constitute. Okay. <laughs> Any other uh -huh. questions? Um, there, there were a couple of questions about using using funds to provide digital programming. You know, for Zoom expenses, yes. which I presume are are appropriate. Yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there's also a question, interesting question about. Uh, ideas for how to reach um, underserved audiences who don't have uh, digital access. Yeah. Um, so if you, maybe just uh, something related to that, uh, pointing people to some creative programming ideas. Or... Yeah, yeah, and I'll say this because I, I realize I don't want to step too much on the last slide, but um, if you're curious about what recent grantees have done you know what what you know what are people doing that are part of the california humanities you know family of grantees that are responding to the circumstances that we're in i i really greatly encourage you to take a look at um our first of all the quick grant and the project grant webpage uh because you can actually see a list of the projects and we provide descriptions of you know, what recent projects, really of all the projects that have been funded, what they look like and how they're going to be delivered. So it might be a great way to kind of jog your memory. I also recommend you take a look at our blog because you can see, you know, we provide really great interviews and highlights of, of the work that our grantees are up to in the field. So that might kind of give you a sense. And the blog is, is you know, we, we provide, it's, it's updated each month. So there's a whole lot going on and it might kind of help you get a sense of what people are doing that, you know, it is actually presenting that hybridized programming or, um, you know, doing that kind of audience engagement work that, that you're mentioning. I also, since Felicia's here, <laughs> um, I'd love to plug the Library Innovation Lab and we have a lot of information provided on our website that shows the, the programming that those, those folks have done that also can give you some good ideas. Um, but you can also reach out to us individually and, and, you know, we're happy to kind of talk through it. 
So, um, so with that said, let me just wrap it up and take us to the last slide. And we can tell you about how to get a hold of us. Since we're at the very, very <laughs> final moment of our time together. And please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions after today's presentation, as well as reviewing our application materials. You, if you have any questions about eligibility, about grant guidelines and requirements, or the Humanities for All program in general, please reach out to me. And again, my name is Lucena Lau Valle. I'm a program officer, and my email address is lvalle -L -L -E at calhum.org. And if you have questions about the online application process and compliance, uh, you can contact my colleague, Brett Connor, who you heard from earlier in our webinar. He is our grants manager, and you can reach him at bconnor, C-O-N-N-O-R, at calhum.org. Thank you for sticking with us. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and best of luck as you prepare your application. Thank you. Thank you all.